I move to accept the agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is Pat here? Not sure. Motion carries four to zero. So Pat, are you on the call yet? All right, let's go ahead and do the pledge. I'm not seeing Pat on the call yet. Okay. I am pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So we have um, 2.1 discussion and direction on the J.O. Combs 2020 21 budget recommendations. Yes, uh, what we want to do today with the special meeting is is go ahead and present to you guys uh, what we're looking at for recommendations for the 2021 budget uh, for the district. Uh, the reality will be this this having a meeting tonight gives us a chance to answer any questions for you. The actual recommendations gets translated into, for example, uh, the actual salary schedules that will come forward um, uh, at the June 10th board meeting. So this is a chance uh, to go ahead and make sure that you understand what we're looking to do with the budget. Um, some of the more key components of the budget. Obviously, um, Carla will make a presentation for the proposed budget in, in June and, and adopted that budget in July, but this kind of <clears throat> sets the tone based on what, what you decide to do with that budget so that Carla can go ahead and move forward with it. So uh, we'd like to go ahead and, and do that presentation. So we'll be running it. Carla and I, we can kind of bounce back and forth on, on the um, uh, slide. So I'll ask Craig to go ahead and pull up the uh, pull up the slideshow. Okay, so what we want to do first off is uh, uh, the purpose of the of the show of the of the slide uh, show. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Carl is going to talk a lot about. So there'll be a couple slides in here. I'll talk about some. Carl will be more than the degree that just talks about what we did when we overviewed the budget, how we came up with this budget, how we came up with the numbers that we're using to then move forward. There is some, uh, I'll, I'll kind of ramp one thing and just note there is a little bit of flexibility within this budget. So some of these numbers that go up there may change a little bit because as an example, because of COVID-19 and, and the schools being closed, our carryover is jumping up and down uh, depending on any number of factors that come in. So, so there still is a little bit of fluidity. It's not much, uh, but the exact numbers up on the screen here may change uh, based on, on um, uh, what happens with uh, the final carryover. Uh, you'll also see a review of the goals from CCC. Uh, what we tried to do when we went ahead and, and looked and developed this budget was address what the concerns that CCC had identified at the beginning of the year. Uh, we want to address specific additions to the MO budget. And then we also want to provide uh, just a little bit of information on the capital projects. Um, that's outside of the budget. We'll probably take a, a stop point uh, when we get done with the MO budget, make sure everybody's got all the questions asked. But then I want to just quickly review some of the work that's being done. Um, across the district uh, starting as we speak so that you can understand some of the things we've talked about in other, in other meetings. You can go ahead and switch to credit. Um, so again, the goals from CCC, these were established in early meetings by CCC. So meet the intent of the governor's 20 by 20 plan, which at this point in time for this district would, would necessitate a 5% raise for all the teachers. Uh, we'll take a look at the compensation study. If you remember, you approved that back in the fall and see how we compare with neighboring districts, but also take issues. Part of the compensation study will address the next one, which is how do we take care of salary, salary compression with the support staff. Um, and just note that, that the 35 cent, that cent increase that everybody was given to the support staff back in, in, in December, uh, that's buried into the, into the salary schedule. So this will be above and on top of the 35 cents. So we'll talk more about that. Talk about uh, another requirement of hiring some more teachers to fill vacant uh, positions and raising initial salary schedules will be competitive. How we're going to attract new students, reducing class sizes, and possible additional pair of support, and then addressing the extra duty stipends. And so that that framed where we wanted to go ahead and try to come up with uh, a budget recommendations for this year. Go ahead, Craig. So I'll start with this, and then Carl will take over. But the basics from the state. Uh, when I say the specifics of the state adopt a budget, that would be the skinny budget. Um, so you know that the legislature formally signed died or ended the session on Tuesday. And um, 
So the skinny budget is the budget that's in place right now. There is a chance the governor will call a special session sometime this summer. Uh, I think they're going to probably not get it till August because they want to look and make sure that they have a better handle on what are the tax revenues that have been coming in with the shutdown. And since they're lagging by about a month, maybe a month and a half, um, you might not see a special session until more of August. And then they'll take a look at what they're going to do with the budget. That might have some impact on us, but Carl and I are not sure that it's going to be a huge impact uh, for a variety of reasons. And if you have questions, we can answer that. Uh, we did build the budget on inflation of 1.70, which is what's the skinny budget. We originally projected 1.89, but we backed that down. Uh, originally, in the governor's proposal, the AA was supposed to be finished out with two, two years payment and one. Once COVID-19 hit, they said, no, we'll do one year of DAA, the fourth year of DAA this year, and then the fifth year next year. So we're back to one year of DAA. Uh, the classroom site fund was projected at a $49 decrease from previous year. There's a slide we'll talk about that. Carl will probably come back up. It gets a little bit confusing, so I want to make sure people understand. Uh, another real key component from the district's perspective is there's no increase in health insurance premium, which can be can be tremendous uh, hit in the school district, but it just didn't happen this year. Uh, and we'll get into more. I mean, Carl, actually, I mean, Carl had a chance to explain this in a second. The commitment to not reduce the budget by the $40 as part of the classroom site fund reduction. So, Carl, why don't you explain a little bit about that $40 reduction? In um, the Prop 301, part of the 20 by 20 for this year only is $40 of it is coming out of the class site fund. And then going next year, it'll go back to MO. So, my thought was, is, you know what, if we could hold back and not use the forty dollars that's coming out of the funds eleven and thirteen, and have it all come from M and L, because what I'm hearing is classroom site funds is going to be again lower. We're at what three eighty five this year, right? It'll be close to that, if not a little bit less next year. So it was just trying to maintain the the base salary. We have a certain amount for each of our certified teachers that's coming from that fund. So I wanted to be consistent because what I didn't want to see is going up and down. The performance pay for this year for the last couple of years has been $4,000. I'm not 100% sure we'll be able to maintain that for next year, but there's a portion of this that may we may have to reduce it, but maybe it's only $3,800 as opposed to $4,000. So what I was really trying to do is keep this, you know, not going up and down, up and down kind of thing. So. Um, we appear to be able to handle it out of MNL. So I think it, it's one of those things that's not going to impact us right today, but it will impact next year. And, and to give you a perspective, uh, going from the 434, which was the dollar amount for this year, down to the, the 385 for next year, uh, the 385 number hasn't been seen in the state uh, since uh, probably right before the recession. And so your performance pay right before the recession was probably somewhere between 2100 and Thousand versus yeah. right now when it's four thousand, so we're trying to mitigate that that tremendous drop off, and then all of a sudden it swings back up and swings back down. We're trying to get there may be some movement, but not make that fall off a cliff one year and then climb all the way back up next year type thing. So, so just know that's that's what they're talking about there. If you give you perspective on what those numbers mean and what's a what three eight five, what's a four thirty four, um, you're really down that I think two thousand five, two thousand six, probably the last time. Yeah, I think it was about it. So. So, Carla, on the um, the uh, classroom site fund is projected at a $49 decrease, and that's one of the bullet points. And then the commitment is to not reduce it by 40. So, what's yeah, the, what's 40, that of, 40 of that was the 20 by 20 percent. It had to do with the debt okay. service for this year. So, knowing that um, we're going to be back to 385 or less. We've got that forty dollars in there to play with for the following year. It'll, it, in theory, it dropped nine dollars, but forty of it's coming because of the twenty by twenty, and that's why it gets really complicated to try and explain it. And, and that nine dollars would, would have been reflective of COVID nineteen and, and, and projected um, uh, state revenues for this year, which is why the JLBC, the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, came up with that nine dollar reduction. It was related to what they're anticipating at that time, because by statute you have to you have to provide that number. Right, basically at the end of March, I think they 
kind of a little bit uh, April this year, right? But, but you're April supposed to do it by March, and so obviously in March we're just starting into this thing, so they kind of make a projection. So that's why they they did it. But it's it's a it's a uh, how do I say it's not a cash account. It's a it's a no, it's a budget. It's right. a budget based account. But so once cash you get the number, reflects with so, it. Right. But once you get a number, then you can spend that number okay. because it's not cash. So so this budget that we're going to be developing is the final year of the twenty by twenty. That's part of what this is going to yes. cover. The final right. Steps. Has the governor or the legislature indicated at all what they are anticipating to be? After the 2020 is complete, is you're talking about. No. And, and I think I think you're going to see uh, until someone sees what the what the bounce back is on the economy. Are we doing a recession? Are we doing a mini recession? Does, does the economy bounce back quicker? What are the the um, uh, revenue state generated revenues that are coming in? Until they start to see that, um, I think everybody's going to be pretty pretty quiet and pretty conservative. Um, that's why I say you won't probably get a study session until August, quite frankly. Uh, it might become sooner, but I think it's going to be August because they have a better idea of what it is. But then you may have a second study session, or excuse me, special session. Mm -hmm. um, you may have a second special session in, in September or October again, uh, just trying to figure out what it is. Uh, because the rainy day fund is flush uh, and there's federal dollars coming in through the stimulus uh, for the COVID-19, uh, wouldn't necessarily mean this year they're going to hit us. K-12 will get hit as hard a year from now. Well, we'll have to take a tackle a year from now, a year from now, depending on the factors. In the skinny budget that was passed, was there any mention of how the close to a billion dollar surplus carryover surplus is, is to be allocated? No, I, I think had we not had COVID-19, you probably would have had a significant discussion of what was going to happen with that as part of this legislative session. Once you got into COVID-19 and they went for for the, we're going to have to get out of here, we're going to in the skinny budget and get out of here um that that changed everything i think once you get to the to the special session there you're going to start to have probably a bit of a battle between the republicans and democrats democrats may want to spend more of the rainy day fund republicans are probably going to want to not spend as much of the uh, of the rainy day fund uh so i think you're going to get uh, a discussion there um this last point I'm, I'm, we'll jump to later we're calling this a conservative budget there may be a lot of people that take a look at what we're doing here compared to maybe some other districts and not understand why we're calling a conservative budget. Some of it has to do with that, and we'll, we'll get into that little more discussion of why we think we're, we're being conservative, even though they appear that we're not, uh, and there's several factors, and I'll try to remember to bring that piece up when we get to that point. Next slide, yeah, okay, then Carl will take over. Okay, so for the last- Hold on just a second. Okay. Um, so, Pat said she was not given the stuff to, to call in. Did, did you send it to her board email? Because no, they we, we've sent we sent it to both. We sent it to her, her board address and we sent it to her um to her um uh, work. I don't know if it's work, it's not the man of health one, it's her it's on the and, agenda in, uh, right, but we sent it, but she was not getting some of it. So so we sent it to, to both uh, email addresses. Not not the man of health email, but her other email. As I think it's an AOL account. I'm going off the top of my head. I can't remember if it's MSN or AOL. So you said I could call, but how far are you in? Uh, we just started. I've never called. Just started. So can I tell her how? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the call in number, if you want, uh -huh. is 1 504 9823. Okay. And there's the pin. The pin is 193. Okay, hold on. 10. 183. 757 pound. 10. Okay. Do I continue or wait to see if she calls in? I'd say, I'd say let's keep going and yep, then we'll, go ahead. we'll keep an eye on when she's coming. We get a beep or something when she joins in? Yeah, well, anytime someone comes in. They, some, we just went from 17 to 18, so she might, that might be her coming in right now. I'm not sure. Let's, I'm not sure where her phone number well, is. So. Can she tell her just to talk when she comes in? Yeah, yeah. See if she'll let us know she's in. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead. About three years ago now, I got involved with a consortium with Pinal County, and we started using this 5CAS Plus software. Basically, what it does is it trends it. You know, it used to be I'd put stuff into an Excel spreadsheet and it'd go on forever. This has got some nice whistles and bells to it. Makes life a little easier. So part of what we start with our process, and it, go, it really starts in November, um, just getting people's um, recommendations. But what we do is I go out and I try and determine what our ABM is going to be for the following year. And, and as you can see on the spreadsheet, we go forward for five years. Um, cohort is the slide that's up here right now. As you can see, we're looking to maybe increase 4.6 students. Um, the following year, we start to go down. We start to see the decline, which is something that I think I've always known, just watching, watching things if nothing happens around here. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, the projected trend. So what I did over the last several years is we get all the ABM in from the past, um, I think we started in 2012. So what you're seeing is your cohort and your trend. And as you can see, um, we're still kind of flat. We're, we're growing, but not, I would say we're flat. Keep in mind these two scenarios, neither one of them have the AOI or the um, alternative schools that we're proposing to start this year. So they're just kind of a contingency, so to speak. So, so this includes all of the new building? Housing no, this is just, right no. And I know we're starting to get developers that are contacting us. I think the developers in the area are starting to get comfortable with maybe what's happening with Johnson Utilities, which I think has been a downfall. <laughs> I can go out, I would probably consider doing this for the following year. I can do a percentage along with, do I want to go with the cohort trend, do a percentage. I figure students, we're probably not going to see students for a couple of years, just, you know, the time it takes to get the houses built. The one, the one exception may be with Archer Meadows, which is down off of Combs and, and Schnapp. So, yeah. um, that one, we would anticipate we might start to see some kids uh starting about january i think they're starting to build the homes down there and so we would we had anticipate oh, potentially seeing some kids there but again uh the number of kids that are coming in isn't isn't gonna move the needle a ton uh depending on i'm not sure what the price of those homes are uh, and what they're who they're marketing for um, but we will start to see those but but some of the other bigger developments on that same strip uh are probably 18 months out so if you look at wales ranch or well or where's farm we we're talking to both of those uh, contractors, but they're looking at potentially about 18 months out before we do anything. So, so this obviously can change with our demographic studies based on when those things start to happen. If they accelerate, then obviously this would change. If they stay at the trend we're at right now, then then this would give us somewhat of a conservative look of, of what we had. So, like I said, you can you can change your snapshots. You know, when you kind of look at what's happened out here. It's either go with using the trend or go with cohort. Um, we had a leadership meeting and kind of what's everybody's thoughts. And to be honest, I think everybody would have liked to have seen trend, but really knew that we probably ought to build our budget on cohort. So the next slide um, really just shows you a snapshot of what our ADM has been, um, more in a chart form as opposed to numbers. And as you can see, um, 2015 is really, there was no net difference. I think that's probably when I really started to zero in on things. 2016, remember we had that drop in um, enrollment. Thanks to current year funding, it hit you immediately. We cut our budget by 1.4. Went back up in 2017, 2018. Um, well, actually, it was 2019 where we had that. Reduction, but you can see we're going. We this district's kind of gone all over the place over the last um, five years, and it appears that it could, if nothing changes, it'll start to decline. Now I think there's going to be changes because obviously we've got developers starting to show interest. I think the next 
probably three, five, and 10 years, there's going to be quite a significant impact in the industry with the building that's going around. But at this point in time, this is just cohorts. Uh, another visual of just what your grade levels look like. Um, you can see they're pretty consistent. <laughs> yeah. And I've noticed that typically this district's had between probably 300, 325 average per grade level. And it, it stayed consistent. Another comparison here is just shows you the visual of how many of our students are elementary, how many of them are high school. You can see in 19, our um, elementary suddenly starts to go down in 20, which when you watch those students go through the cohorts, you, I, I could have told you that without going through this, but um, and you start to see high school go up, then it starts to go back down. And it's just, you know, the reflection of what the student count is right now. But but that's also tight. I mean, that, those numbers right there would, would model what you're going to see in Pinal County as of right now. But again, if, if Johnson Utilities gets their stuff together, uh, you'll start to see some big developments down in Florence start to go. Um, and then obviously, so your birth rates right now in Pinal County should reflect a decrease over the next uh, number of years. Um, and that's probably related to recession, related to um, uh, rentals and those kind of things. But once the housing starts to go and it starts to, to build again, then you're going to drive until you can buy. And all of a sudden you're going to have younger families in and all of a sudden all of those well, rates that have shown this go. negative at Pinal County in our district is going to start to change. Um, but as of right now, if you talk to Pinal County, you'll see a very similar pattern um, over the next five years. Um, but that could obviously change uh, depending on the next couple of years and what happens. So then this is Group B comparisons. Um, again, you can see we're starting to see some of that go down. And then it kind of goes back up. Uh, that changes. You know, that can change from day to day type of thing. But that's just... Again, what, what's group B? Uh, it's, it's most most of your special ed um, oh. students, ELL, those types. So, and again, it kind of goes along with the trend of our cohorts. And then, then the next uh, slide really just showing the general budget limit going from 2015 through 2025, and this. And it's based on the cohort, so you can see in 2022, 23, 24, it looks like our uh, GBL will start to go down. But as I said earlier, I think that that will change because I do believe it will go up. So, so again, if you look at those numbers, then again, these might change a little bit because of, of um, uh, what our carryover is. But essentially, what we're projecting our limit for next year will be 29 300,000 uh, change. Uh, if we were to carry over expenses for this year, that's at 28,152. So, walking into this, how we build the budget, how we go ahead and take a look at, at CCC requests, how we look at the governor's 20 by 20, you're starting with, with a net piece of, of roughly 1.1 million to work with. I will tell you, in some of the things that we're looking for and the solutions we give you, they're not just straight out of the seminal budget. Uh, we are looking at, um, I, I talked to Carla, and when I look at some things within the budget myself, it's like, so how do we generate revenue? Or how do we save over here to spend over there? And so you'll see lots of different things that are taking place. So you, if you add up the math, you make them up and say it doesn't add up, it adds up more than $1.1 million and those kind of things. That's because it gets a little bit com uh, complicated as to where we're looking to, to take some money to, to cover it. And I'll try to cover some of those those. Uh, examples here in the next couple slides but so just know within this this is still a little bit of a moving target it may get a little bit tighter uh, come um, uh, the uh, proposed and adopted budget but even then after that there's still going to be a little bit of uh, change depending on what the legislature does on a number of factors uh, and, and with the skinny budget and the COVID-19 we're still not sure what they're going to do so we're, we're tracking that but then I'll get back to where we've got a conservative budget and how we how we put some safety nets in uh, so that so that even though it may look like we're aggressive, we do have three or four safety nets in place um, for what we want to do, and, and that's where the conservative piece comes in. Is that is that we have some safety nets in case we were to lose 150 kids, as an example. How, how do you handle that on the current year funding? Well, we'll talk about that. Okay. 
So is the is one of the assumptions for the budget for 2021 that school will open in July and we'll be back to a normal type of a situation? I wouldn't say that's an assumption per se. Um, that is our hope. Uh, that is what we're planning on. I would say that based on the indicators that I'm seeing right now on several different levels, go up from the, the, the federal level all the way down, uh, that that's a strong possibility, but we will be planning. Uh, so we have three scenarios that we're working on, a traditional school opening, a hybrid opening, and a total remote opening. Um, and then we'll adjust accordingly to that. Uh, that could be a situation. Uh, I think this is where we'll get to this unknown. Uh, if we take a look at this year and we, we take a look at how we did food service and how many meals we, we provided, um, and because everything that was going down with the national shutdown, they loosened up and liberalized uh, what the reimbursement rates are for those dollars. And so we were, we were hanging in there with the amount of meals we we're paying and what we're going to get reimbursed for those meals. Um, depending on what happens on the federal level next time, uh, I'm sure there's more than a few people out there that would suggest there's a strong possibility that we're not going to shut down the economy again. If you don't shut down the economy again, are they going to be quite as liberal relative to reimbursement rates on food service? So whereas this year we came out okay on the food service, lost some money, but wasn't too bad because we get the reimbursements. You do another shutdown next year, I might be coming to you with a totally different conversation because the feds aren't going to throw out a, a trillion dollar care package like they did this year. So that's where you start to get some of this, this unknown. And so we try to, to create some safety nets depending on how it evolves, uh, it, it may, I mean, we could all be sitting here six months from now saying, boy, I didn't see that one coming. But we believe based on what we're seeing and hearing that it's still a responsible budget. But there is a little bit of unknown just because of, of coming out of COVID-19. Okay, next one. So I wanna just spend a few minutes time on this uh, because this is probably a philosophical difference, uh, not only in this district, but the East Valley. Uh, you have a couple options on how you want to go ahead and take, uh, take care of salaries. And the first option is just a percentage increase. Everybody gets the same percentage increase. Obviously, that means different dollar amounts for people. If I get 10%, then we're going to be that high, but for kicks and giggles. If I get 10% on a $35,000 salary, that total number of dollars I get is going to be different than if I get 10% on a $50,000 salary. Um, so you'll get, you will reward your veteran teachers because you're going to go ahead and give a percentage increase and those that have been in the district longer or, or the higher on the salary schedule will get more. However, it makes it very difficult to go ahead and work on the base salary amount and increasing the base salary amount. So the second option is to increase the base salary amount. In that particular case, everybody gets the same dollar amount. If you're going to take your base from one number to another number, that difference will be spread across the entire salary schedule. So every employee will get the same. In that particular situation, you will get the same dollar amount but it will mean a different percentage increase. In this particular situation, those on the far end of the salary schedule just entering our system will get a higher percentage increase. Because if I give you $2,000, $2,000 on $35,000 is gonna be greater than $2,000 on $50,000. Um, but you can take the, the base salary uh, uh, and address the base salary situation. In some cases with option two, you can address the, the differential uh, on, on percentage and that's what we try to do this year and so I can explain that when we get to that slide. Questions on that because and what's happened in the I'll say in the East Valley and some of you guys can help me out. Uh, the, the option has always been option one as a general statement across the entire East, East Valley. Uh, in other districts I use facing because I was there. Our, ours was always option number two. Again what we were trying to do up there was quite frankly because we're close enough trying to be competitive with districts down here. So we couldn't sit and just give everybody a, a percentage increase because then we'd never move our base and our base would be at 32. And we're trying to compete with, with the East Valley uh, and Scottsdale and everybody's his base is sitting at 42 or 45 or 47. Nobody's gonna come work for us. So we were forced to do option two up there. Down here, a different scenario, you can move for option one. Our problem is, if you remember back to CCC, one of the things they wanted to do is fix the competitiveness of the base salary. And that's why we're looking at the option one. So didn't we, what about the guy that did the comparison thing? What so, did he, what did he, what did he think? Uh, with the comparison study, you, you actually have a, uh, trying to get to the 40th percentile uh, within the comparison group. And so you had teachers and administrators that were, were closer to the 40%, I think it was the 37th, 38th percentile. You had uh, classified or support staff that was at the 28th percentile. So he gave us scenarios on how we could get there. 
uh, we can't get there in one fell step, especially for support staff, for class, excuse me, for certified and for administration, we can get there a little bit easier because you don't have, you have a two percent, three percent gap. Um, when you're sitting around a twelve percent, thirteen percent gap to classify, uh, as much as we'd like to, there's not enough dollars in the budget. So even though he gave us a salary comparison, we'll talk about it in more detail. What we ended up having to do was uh, it's going to have to be spread out over a few years. And I'm going to say this because I know it's going to come up because it comes up everywhere I've been. Today, right now, I can tell you that we can do it in three years. If we go into legislative session next year because of recession, because of COVID-19 rebound or something like that, and the dollars aren't there, it may just move down to four years. Um, I can't predict the future. We're, we're, we would plan with, we do this this much this year, this much next year, and this much the year after that. But we're right now at the mercy of a really unknown situation. And so we're just going to have to address it each year as we move forward. Our goal will be to get everybody up there as quickly as we can. But the reality is, again, if we look at what Carla's saying on cohort uh, numbers, and if our numbers start to go down in a couple of years, we're trying to combat that, we'll talk about that, then obviously that may change. Um, so we are using the compensation study for, for the recommendations in here, uh, and it's just kind of embedded, and I'll try to bring it up and, and talk about it. Next, next slide. So when we look at the classified, or excuse me, the certified staff, uh, again, the goal was to get the 5% uh, for the certified staff, yet still raise the initial salary. So the, the, uh, the recommendation is to raise the starting salary schedule of 42,000. The difference between 39 and 426, which is where we're at right now, and 42,000 is 2,574. So every single employee in the district will get $2,574. When you look at that amount applied to everybody's salary, there are some people that that amount there will give them about six and a half percent increase. Okay. Then there are another group of people that are below 5%. So what we did is we went ahead and took a look at everybody that was below 5% and did a mathematical equation of what would it take to get you at 5%. And we went ahead and plugged that into the number. So I say on this one, which is a little bit different than some of the other ones, all certified staff at a minimum will receive a 5% increase. Therefore we're, uh, in conjunction with what the governor's asking. Will some of the newer teachers uh, receive a little more than 5%? Yes, they will. Um, but nobody, we went ahead and went back and looked, nobody gets jumped. So it's not like if I'm a new teacher coming in and if I'm at, if I'm coming in with no experience, I'm, I'm truly going to get bottom dollar 42,000. There isn't a teacher in the system right now that when we give them the 2574 and everything else, they're below 42. Now, there may be a couple of them only 100 bucks or 150 bucks above, um, but they're not jumped in this particular scenario. Um, and so that was one of the factors that we wanted to take a look at is how do we get to the 5%? How do we go ahead and move to a new salary schedule that makes us a little more competitive with everybody in the East Valley? Um, and we believe this particular recommendation uh, kind of takes care of two or three issues. I'll just say that I've heard since I've come into the district, and that's why we tried to look at something uh, in a creative way to way to address those so i'll ask any or answer any questions on this one no, so just what you said i think it's an important point that no one's going to be jumped will be below the 42 and even if they're only a hundred dollars above they're still getting close to a six point something percent raise and not the five percent right. right. so there's really it's the people at the upper end that would be getting short change but it looks like you're making that up so they won't get short change right and, and for perspective uh, and i understand there will be some uh, teachers on the upper end that we feel that it's not fair. I've been here longer and, and I be less. The only thing I would say is just remember 1% of $42,000 is $4 um, I think the issue that's there is you can stay in option one from now until the end of time. You can stay in option two from now until the end of time. Both of those will have ramifications for what the district's trying to do. What I believe we need to do is bounce back and forth between one and two. So there may be you don't want some years based on what the budget looks like that you may want to go ahead and, and, and go with the percentage increase. But, there, but if you do that for the next 10 years, everybody's taken care of, but we're no longer competitive with these salaries. So I think we have to move back and forth between the two. What will be the deciding factor? I will leave the budget to be totally honest. Uh, it depends on how much you have. And you may say there's, such, there's only this much, so it's just easier to give everybody a percentage than try to give everybody $200, you know, increase or something like that. But we'll be bouncing back and forth to try to hit both of these goals um, over the next number of years. And there's also another way to look at this. Um, if you remember the Auditor General talks, when we get the annual report, talks about what percentage of your 
your workforce or your teachers leave within a certain period of time. Right? And part of keeping the staff and not having to train new employees all the time is to pay competitively with those around. So this goes toward right. that, that, that was well. the animal. That was the, 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 what we were really trying to accomplish with this. Other questions? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So then with administration, um, again, what uh, one of my philosophies coming in is, is, is we try to treat everybody equal to the best of our ability. Sometimes it's easier than others. So in this particular situation, we kind of went with the same philosophy. Um, in this case, we we're looking at a $3,000 increase. So teachers get 2574, uh, administration will be 3,000. So we're more competitive with um, other uh, uh, neighboring districts. And then we took a look to see who was not at 5% based on the 3,000 and figured out the difference to get to 5%. But here's the big difference. In the case of teachers, you really only have one portion of the salary schedule that happens to have 300 people in it. So you're going to get a differentiation in, in percentage increases based on whether you're 42 or 50 or whatever. That's why it was at a minimum 5%. In the case of administrators, you have individual categories for every single administrator. So in this case, every single administrator just got 5%. Nobody got more than 5%. And that's because we just applied the number to everybody and made them right at 5%. So um, nobody's at 6%, nobody's at, at 7%, uh, but nobody's at 4%. In this case, everybody got 5%. So if three thousand dollars was not five percent, that three thousand is an increase to whatever to make it five percent. Right. So if, it was, if you needed thirty five hundred to be at five percent, the three thousand, then then you got an additional five hundred dollars, which is the same thing we did with the teachers. Uh, in this case, of the teachers, it was for the lower end to get to uh, to five five percent. There was teachers that were above above that. In the case of the administrators, it's right at five percent. Nobody's going above. Carl, I hope you know the answer to this question. Remember last year when we voted on increases, we had a three tiers, different percents for each tier. I believe we gave um, certified 11%, and then the group of 44 that they were ended up with 8%. 8%. And then what was the last the, um, tier? That, that was the first year of um, 20 by 20, right. and we gave them 5%. And then last right. year, we gave, I believe it was 5%, for certified that included that 44. 44 right and then we gave two percent to everyone else two percent okay so so it went from for administrators which we're looking at now went from five to two and we're proposing five, five. again okay. other, other questions so if you go to the next slide Craig. so for the exempt support staff uh, same concept as we just got done discussing. The only difference is, is you're at a thousand increase and then figure out who's not on the 5%. So you're going to see this gradiated out for an exempt support staff. Um, they were at a thousand for their increase, uh, plus the difference when you get the teacher certified staff, they were at 2574. When you get the administrators, they were at 3000. And so there's a, there's a, a, a consistent pattern across these three groups. Again, at the end of the day, the exempt support staff, nobody made more than 5%, nobody made less than 5%, they made exactly 5%. So these guys would be very similar to what the new church were. And um, just refresh my memory, who are the members of the CCC? Uh, it's, it's a combination, I don't have all, but it's a combination of representatives of teachers, support staff, administration. There's about what, Mark, 33 members? Uh, that's correct, it's Dr. Martin, about right. 33 members. That's okay. across all employment uh, groupings. Right. And, and this, it, grew, it grew when we went to the 20 by 20 because we added in the red for red yeah. representatives. And this, this has been presented to both leadership and CCC. And, and how did they, how did CCC? Uh, I have not seen the final one. I know that uh, the facilitator, Amanda Keach, put out a survey. I think we had 10, 12 people of the 30 respond. I don't know if the numbers have changed. Um, and she did a thumbs up, sideways, thumbs down. And everybody was either thumbs up or sideways. So there was no thumbs down. Uh, now, some, that was as of Monday. So something happened today. That I'm not aware of, we can take a look at it. But but at this at that point, we were seeing everything as a, I'll just say thumbs up or thumbs sideways. Go to the next one. Now for support staff, it came a little bit. It became a little bit more confusing. Um, and the reason it became more confusing is because we we're looking to address comp, uh, a compression. And the problem with compression, if you just go to a, a typical salary schedule. You would start at row A and go down to row whatever. We were at double F, I think. The problem was over the years, what we had done was take row A, B, C, D, E, and F and wipe them off the salary schedule. 
So we compressed everybody that was in those to the same area. Same time, we kept G, H, I, and J at $12. So you really took almost one-third of your salary schedule and just compressed it down into a much smaller uh, room. On top of that, even though you went all, all the way out to F to double S, you had many rows that had nobody in there. There was no job that went there. So when we took a look at the salary schedule and what the recommendations were, first of all, we started back up A and just go down to T. And I'll show you an example of the salary schedule in just a second. Um, so we try to go back to a more traditional look-see. Now, the difference here is um, in order to uncompress the salary schedule, we built the salary schedule. And I'm going to have you go forward one slide, Craig, and call it up, and then I'll come back. So if you could click on that link. So when you look at this particular salary schedule, you're going to sit and see that the way we built it is you're going to take range A to, I believe it's E or F. I don't have it right off the top of my head. And we built that on a 1.7% increase. We then took roughly F or G and went down to about L. And we built that on a 1.2% increase. And then, so the difference between each step is, is, is 1.2%. Then we went from there to the bottom of the salary schedule and built it off of 1.4. Why did we do that? In order to uncompress the salary schedule, if you did this A through T, but everybody was just 1.70, you just rearranged it, but you haven't really done anything about compression. You're gonna to have to give the groups on the farther end of the salary schedule more percentage increase or you're never gonna fix the compression. And the goal all along was to fix the compression. Now, we couldn't quite do what uh, the, the compensation study wanted because there wasn't enough dollars in the budget to do that. So there's probably a two or three year, there'll be some other adjustments and, and, and changes uh, to this salary schedule um, uh, over the next couple of years to try to address the, the, the compression. But this starts to address the compression. So if you go back to slide now, uh, Craig, and then we can come back to this one. Um, oops. Oh. Give him a workout. Okay, so in order to do that, the, your 1.70 would be basically uh, inflation. Now, here's one thing we did for those individuals. So there's a couple things you got to remember with that group of individuals. Um, the 1.70 for inflation was calculated because in Prop 206, some people don't realize after we moved the, 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 the basic um, starting salary minimum wage from 10 bucks to 12 bucks, Prop 206 isn't over. What Prop 206 requires each successive year is that you increase uh, the $12 based on the inflation factor. Our decision this year for all employees was rather than just wait until January, we would go ahead and make the, the increase starting in July. Again, that increase is above and beyond the 35 cents that was approved in, in January. And so when you do that and you apply that to all the, to, to all the groups, the average salary increase is 5.46%. So we're sitting here at, a little, at basically at minimum 5%, 5%, 5%, and on average 5.46. It's on average because if we try to get everybody the same increase, we would not address the compression issue. By doing this on average, there are some employees that are going to be down in the range of, um, of 1.7 because that's what the percentage increase. There are other employees, quite frankly, that would be in the range of 8%. Because if you're higher on the salary schedule, in order to uncompress the salary schedule, we've got to give these people more money. Otherwise, all we're doing is keeping the compression. We just have changed the way it looks. Does that make sense? I have a question, a couple of questions. I'm looking at the um, current support staff mm -hmm. salary schedule. You were talking about G through FF. Yeah. On G, the lowest hourly rate is $12. Right. And on the new one, A, it's $12.20. Yep. So that's, that's not... That's 1.7%. Okay. But, but on the old, the double F is $20.70, and the highest T is $20.07. That's a reduction. No, that was a typo. What should it be? Should it be 20, 20. 27 Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but again, you, you moved off. You ended up cutting out some of the levels. But uh, you, you'll see, go up to the next slide, Craig, again, and pop open that salary schedule. You'll see today that, uh, and going over with HR, so you, you may see some changes. You see a couple uh, positions that are, are bolded. Mm -hmm. That's only because um, me not understanding uh, the, the configurations of the compensation study was changing titles for people 
and me not understanding what's there. So even from what I gave you last week, this is new. When, when we get to the June 10th meeting, you'll have them all there. But here's what happens so everybody sees. You don't see it on this one, but we'll just use the example you gave up. So you had on, on a person that was at 12 bucks. Uh, in this case, A uh, was at 12 bucks. They went up to 20, 12, 20. So everybody in that category got a 20 cent increase. Um, so when you come down to but someone it, went but from- But they're 35 cents already in there. Right. Okay. And so if they went from, if they were at 15 bucks and the new call is to go to 1650, then everybody in that category got about 15. And that's where you're starting to get. So, you, so not only are you getting differences between categories, you're potentially getting difference between if I'm a brand new employee and I'm at the base of the salary schedule compared to uh, an employee that's been here five, 10 years, it's a different amount. Um, and so that's why it's on average 5.46%. Um, it, it would have been double or triple the amount of money that we spent if we tried to do with the compensation study in one fell swoop set. And you would have seen some people, quite frankly, that would have doubled their, their take home. Uh, and so that's so what we, you were saying earlier about having right. to spread it out over three years. Right, because it just is, it just was not feasible. So we felt this was a good, uh, uh, between what happened in January and between the recommendation here, uh, this is a good faith, faith effort to go ahead and address uh, the support staff um, who maybe haven't, uh, because of compression, haven't been addressed as much over the years. Um, and this is a way to take care, which, which again, as I was told, was a very uh, important factor for CCC. And so that's what we try to do, and that's why we did the, the compensation study, was to say, okay, how do we help everybody out, and how do we start to stretch this thing back out so it looks like a normal salary schedule uh, and reflects. And, and these numbers to the side, the 101 to 120, you see A101, uh, the way the compensation study worked is he looked at every single job. Uh, there's, I have to get him to explain it to me in more detail, but he looks at a variety of different factors with every single job, area of responsibility, uh, workload, those kind of things, and said, um, and it's it's being done for all the districts. It's not unique to us. Anybody in the compensation study did that. The lowest person on the number scale was 101. The highest person was superintendent. I think it was at 140 or 145. So everybody's gradiated out between 101 and 140, and that and, and that's what that number means. Um, uh, and so that's a way for us to look in the future as we add new positions. If we want to change the title, where would they radiate out compared to everybody else in terms of areas of responsibility and those kind of things? Uh, and that's how that, that particular uh, uh, piece works on it. And so what you'll see, and I didn't put it up for everybody else, but I will hand you out. Yeah, you got those. Here is a oops, pass, pass these down. These are the salary schedules printed out of each of the each of the four groups. So because uh, I didn't click on them for, for each group. So this way you have it. Uh, please note again, there may be a few changes between now uh, and June 10th as we clean things up as as HR points out some of my errors, which I appreciate tremendously. Uh, we will go ahead and make all the all the corrections there. But that gives you what the salary schedules will be coming forward with you. Those salary schedules, what do they mean? Well that's reflective of the recommendation uh, uh, in there. And then that's the way it will be applied to everybody on the, every, every employee in the district, uh, that's the way it'll be applied. I, got to, I, I like the layout of this where you not only have the range, but you have the position name on the old one. Right. There was no position name and you had to cross-reference it to another document. Right. And, 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 we're, and we're looking for these to be more the out-facing document that will go on the, on the, uh, on the web. On web page versus what we had before, which is a more of an internal document, which is where's, where's initial placement. That's right. really an HR. Function, so we'll keep that in house, um, and then we'll just do that as an outfacing uh, piece. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the other, the other thing that was asked was extra duty stipends, and so on the extra duty stipends, um, uh, it was being calculated off of uh, thirty-five five nineteen, which was the base in the rears back at Old Mexico years back and so what the recommendation here was to go ahead and uh, place it off of 42. Uh, the various positions out there if you want me we can call up the, the slide the, the, the salary schedule if you if you don't need to call up we won't because we'll be bouncing back and forth but the idea is I think the highest uh, stipend is 10 percent so if you were 10 percent of 35 19 versus 10 percent of 42 you can see a slight increase in what they're getting most of the positions range between two percent and ten percent 
And so that would be reflective of the increase of the for those people, whether the department chairs, whether they have a choir, man, football coach, baseball coach, um, all those different kinds of things <clears throat> were factored in uh, uh, into the new uh, uh, classified salary schedule, or excuse me, the extra, extra duty salary schedule. In terms of these extra duties, did we ever have problems with filling some of these positions because of low pay? No, no. but it, when we originally started this, you know, we were phasing in the high school, and unfortunately, that was when the recession hit. So we, you know, we froze it. We um, added it back up to what the uh, initial salary uh, placement was two years ago. Last year, we just didn't have the funds to do it. So um, that's really why we have done it. But I don't know that we've had since we've maintained it a hundred percent up until just last year. I don't think it's been as bad of an issue, but but, obviously. but I think one of our one of our um, goals within this whole thing again, when we say remain competitive or be competitive with other districts, it's across the board in everything we do. It doesn't matter whether what what the position is that we're trying to hire. Is it is classroom aid? Uh, is it a principal? Is it a teacher? Is it a coaching position? We want to make sure that we are competitive with everybody else in these valley. Now, it's a little bit hard. We can't be 100 percent competitive because every one of them is about 50 percent all right. Um, but but that's why why lag on this one. Let's go ahead and see if there's a way for us to uh, take it take it in the future. We may not have to increase quite as much, but we can still at least try to remain competitive. So that's the reason we move forward with this. And again, it was a CCC um, recommendation to take a look at it. So we decided to take it. Next slide. Okay, so again, these, these numbers may change a little bit on you just as we as we factor in uh, different situations and we can talk about those. But it gives you a, a, a pretty good ballpark out of MO budgets only. The number is higher, but if you're a grant funded position, then you would get the increase but it would come out of the grants. So that's that's why we're saying MO only, because this reflects what's the MO portion um, of the budget. And so that'll give you a, a target amount of what, what we're spending in each of the each of the categories. So would this be an accurate statement if you look at the one million twenty-six thousand and you compare it to the new money that we saw in a slide earlier of one million one hundred and sixty-three thousand? We're covering all of this with the new money, but still a little bit left over. Right, and, and that'd that, be kind of an accurate. Portrayal. Yes, and then some of the things we're going to do in future months will show that that we actually bring back even more money in. You know, the one point one is just on simple math. When we start canceling your contract here or doing something there, then there's other additional dollars that are available, both for safety net as well as the, the ability to cover uh, different things we want to do within, within the and district. Also built into this, I know, Carl, you've always been very diligent about having anywhere from a 3 to 5% coming over carryover from year to year. Still will we'll be within that range? So, I mean, okay. well, I mean, you know, know something is more luck, but, but that's not that, COVID 19 right. doesn't come back, but that's what you're, you're looking for. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we're, we're looking to make sure we maintain that same contingency. Next slide. So, I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker, but some of the things we've already talked about hiring, uh, we had uh, uh, kindergarten teachers, and then we had a lead pair pro as the second half of the kindergarten. Uh, we believe it's in the best interest for our students to have every student single kindergarten. With a, with a highly certified teacher. So we're moving forward to, to hire um, seven additional kindergarten positions. Let me talk to you. So with the cost of that, I'm going off of rough numbers, I know I'm close, but Carl probably had some down, but I think it was about $420,000 to do that. However, um, the lead parapro positions we no longer needed. So there was a saving of $200,000 there. So this is where this is not just a, a zero sum game. Now, did any, does that mean we fired uh, all the lead parapos. Now we have other parapro positions available. If they wanted a parapro position, they were given a parapro position. The salary schedule was pretty close to what they were getting with the raise, and so nobody took a pay cut either. Um, and so there's a situation where jobs were retained for those people, but at the same time, uh, uh, we were able to make this work with with not the full cost, but half the cost. So those are the kinds of things as we move forward with some of these, and that's where that number gets to be moving around a little bit. Um, be more than happy to discuss as much as we need to, but some of it gets complex as we shift into the funds. We want to make sure we increase the band position at the high school to full time. Mm -hmm. And then this principal half time, the other half time would be at the high school, four teachers and administrative assistant for the alternative schools in the AOI. Uh, one of the ways right away that we picked up $180,000, that's what we're paying the graduation alliance for our kids currently in the system. And so we went ahead and, and 
cancel the contract with Graduation Alliance. Um, so right away, when we look at this number, which again is in the 400 and I think 80,000 range is what it was, right out of the gate, you got um, uh, $180,000 savings by canceling the Graduation Alliance uh, contract. We also have 38 kids that are currently with Graduation Alliance. The number will probably be down to maybe about 30 because some of those kids will graduate this year. Those kids are tailor-made to come into our alternative school starting next year. We have said that if we get to um, 100 kids, um, and, you know, if you did 38 plus 70 or plus 60 or 62, that's your 100 kids, then we'll be at a break-even point. Uh, as a part of the hiring process with the, with the principal we're going through the interviews right now, uh, they've been incentivized. We, if you get us over 200 so we start making money, um, then we'll go ahead and look at making that a full-time position. Uh, and so part of the issue here when we talk about the, the loss of kids that Carl was talking about on a cohort, we hope to reverse that trend with our alternative schools in area wise. You go ahead and pull in um, kids from uh, neighboring districts that may not have an alternative school and they have a place to go now. Uh, and alternative schools, again, we've talked about it before, that's a school of choice. It may be kids that have a distant problems, but also maybe kids that need a, a smaller setting, and maybe kids that need to work jobs, and maybe kids that have uh, social anxiety for being in large high schools. But you put those kids in and you start to reverse the trend and say, we pull 100 kids that are not our kids. That would reverse that trend and whatever Carla had on that spreadsheet will look totally different next year. Uh, and so when we look at a, at a 9 12 alternate school, a 6 8 alternate school, and an AOI, we would hope that in total we would get ourselves right to about 200 kids. Will it happen by September? Uh, probably not. Uh, do we hope we have it by the end of the year? Yeah. Because you'll have kids that will come into the system starting in January because they now <laughs> failed some classes and they're trying to stay on target, want to graduate. Um, and so that's, uh, but it's a situation where, where can, uh, we took the money to help pay for that out of direct, you know, indirect costs, uh, which is part of the grant funding piece. Um, and if we get the kids during the school year, then that money goes back into direct costs because current year funding will cover for it. So we're looking at funding sources that, that will be a one-time funding source potentially because uh, we have enough money in there. Uh, and then if we get the number of kids, uh, that'll be a, a gain for the for the district. So again, that's not all coming out of the know. So when you look at that number, you say you said 480, you said 400 time before, that's 800,000, you might be 800,000 October. That's because in this case, we're not funding the side of we're funding a lot of other sources. I think a lot of the uh, determination as to whether this is going to be a success or not and get that increase you're talking about is a kind of marketing publicity. And so I guess that's uh, Kayla's going to be uh, right. <laughs> working then, with whoever this principal is. To right. As well as we, if you remember, Couple months back, we approved the marketing specialist position, and that would be part of that same thing. So yes, we'll be we'll be marketing this, um, and and that will be a key to the principal and their personality. Will be key to attracting kids too. And so so as we do interviews, uh, that'll be one of the factors that we're looking with in interviews is who do we think has that um, that special personality that is I'll just say it, I always describe it this way as a kid magnet. If you get a kid magnet in that school, you'll have kids come to that school. Um, I know some people may look at those kids with a jaundiced eye. Uh, to me, they're just kids. They're kids that are looking for something uh, a little bit different than what they currently have, and they're pretty good kids. Um, and they're just trying to be high school kids trying to get through, or middle school kids trying to get through, or a crazy world we live in. And so I think we'll see some good positive things. Great. It sounds to me that you're kind of anticipating it. So you're anticipating that, the, that this alternative school will serve as an attraction to, to new kids yep. to the district who are not currently in the district. Yep. If, if this is a trade-off of just internal kids, if we just take 200 kids from the high school and move them to 200 kids to the alternative school, then we're, we're not we're not getting gaining anything out of this. So our intention is not just to be there. Will be kids at the high school that come down for a variety of reasons, um, but if, this is not just a case of trying to take our high school kids and give them another place to go. This is a case of trying to do a combination of of high school kids from our district, but high school kids from potentially other districts, other schools. Right, but you're ho you're hoping that there's at least 100. Or almost 200 new kids, because yeah. there's bound to be kids from our district who are going to right, want to right. choose the high school. And I, and I would say, I would say that, that you know 200 total, so it might be 50 from internal. I would say that in this neck of the woods, just my assessment is, um, I don't know that there's a ton of alternative schools that provide offerings for kids. And so I think you have some kids. Uh, the way you run the alternative school, you'll have a morning session, an afternoon session, and that may work for a kid that needs a needs a job. And they can go in the morning session and still be able to work a job in the afternoon. And so it's it's not that they're in some cases not even satisfied with the school they're in, but if they have to work, 
and they can't get a schedule that meets it to keep them on target to graduate, we have a way to keep them on target to graduate while still meeting their needs. That's why I think we can get kids from, from not just our own district, but, but other areas here. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I agree with that, and I, you know, I, I'm, I support this idea, and I, I think it will serve to, to do that. I just, I just think that we may have more kids from our own district, maybe more than we anticipate, who might want to choose this alternative. You know, you're talking about kids who have, you know, want if, if it's available, so you can get a, so you can work a job and go to school. There may be a higher number of kids from our own school who would say, oh, I, I want to do that, and so we may. We may find that the numbers might be pretty high, but initially a lot of it may come from our own kids. And then my other question is, um, obviously I haven't had a chance to talk too much more about some of the plans for the alternative program, but is, is, it, is it part of the plan that this would serve as a credit recovery for students within our program, that that yeah. might be one of the aspects of this alternative it, it program or not? It could be one of the aspects, yes. It depends. Uh, the, the question is, what's the, what's the travel time between two schools? And, and if I'm trying to do my normal schooling at the high school and then try to get down here and take a class, it probably will have to it probably will have to be that individual uh, that schedule works for this. Um, mm -hmm. And so there could be some credit recovery within it. Um, uh, and we'll just have to play it by ear again. It's not a huge drive, but but you got a five ten minute drive. So what what are what's the timing uh, based on lunches and those kind of things? Uh, but that's a, that's a possibility. Yes. Any others? Next slide. Uh, again, um, we did the Arizona online, so those all of the alternative schools have been uh, <laughs> forward with, and so I don't know if there's anything more to add to that slide with that, but that's the intention of, of trying to increase and, and change the numbers. Next slide, please. Um, we're also looking at uh, uh, increasing some employee dates. Um, one of the things we want to look at is our schools need to be open all, all year long. If I have someone that wants to, wants to enroll in my school and I come and, and on the door it says closed from June 15th to July 15th, and they go down the street to, we'll just say, LA or Ben Franklin or Legacy or somebody else, and they sign and they're open. We just lost that kid. And so, starting in July, we want our summers, our, our, our employees to be on 12 months so that we can actually meet the needs of our public all year long and not be closed down for a full month. So, that's the reason for that. The increase in paraprofessional work agreements by two days. Uh, the reality there is we're asking parapros to come on and uh, aides to come on the day the school starts. So I'm going to take an age who's never been on the campus and I'm going to put them on the playground at 8 o'clock in the morning the first day they're in campus. I don't think that's a real good solution. It could place a dangerous situation. So if we have them on for at least two days, we can give them some training. We can give them a chance to feel what the, what the district looks like, what the school looks like. They know who the school principal is. And so we're adding two more dates there. Uh, and then we're looking at transportation dispatch and professional development specialists in 12 months just because of all the things that are going on in the case of the professional development specialists. Uh, I think there's been just a little bit of professional development on the last nine weeks. I could be wrong, but I think we had a little bit of professional development learning. And so uh, those kind of things are such that we need to have someone on full time that's, that's, uh, uh, that's helping out in that area. In terms of this increase in employee days, what's the cost of that going to be? Uh, I, it's, it's factored into so the three, I think it was the 347 I had up there, that was factored into that cost. So that's not an additional cost. I can't remember when I teased it out exactly how much of it was, but I just buried it all into the three into the three three seven. Yeah, so that's all the cost. Next slide. Yeah, it, it is definitely a, a necessary move. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly charter schools. That's that was a specific strategy all charter schools in the area did. We did when I was there. I mean, having having the offices open all year all year long was a specific strategy to try to siphon off kids from the public schools. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, at times it was effective because public schools are closed and parents have arrived from out of town and they're trying to figure out how they're going to get their kids enrolled. And so I agree, we got to do this. Okay, so before I go to this next part, uh, so why did I call this a conservative budget? When you take a look at it, you look at all the things we're doing, a lot of people say, oh, it's conservative. But what we do is we do have some safety nets in there. So one of the things that's tied directly to the next slides we're going to talk about because we're going to spend approximately $22 million to fix up our facilities, we're not going to really dump into DA very much district conditional assistance. And so the dollars that they're giving us from district conditional assistance, I think this year it's roughly $163,000 is what our cut is. We don't have to use that because all we need to do is cover the regular operational expenses to maintain our facilities. Um, and so right away you have 163 and with carryover you have more than that, but that you could that you could move over to m if you needed to, if we also lost some kids. Um, we've gone ahead uh, and uh, taken a look at, 
again, uh, the old school and the savings and the amount of kids coming in there, we anticipate that there'll be some dollars coming in there. Uh, there's another thing that you probably have seen. Uh, um, I can give you a heads up uh, the other day, and you may have seen some letters from some individuals I met with the custodial staff. Uh, the recommendation from our uh, standpoint would be that we go ahead and outsource custodial. Uh, we believe there's there's a major reason why we would even look at it. When we looked at, it, uh, at, at outsourcing of the custodial staff, we're sure that, that the employees will have jobs. And so therefore, if, if, if it was like, no, nobody's going to have a job, no one would proceed with it because they're going to have jobs. Uh, they will see some increases and they'll see some decreases. So this is not just a perfect scenario for everybody. Uh, and we understand that. Um, but what it allows us and what's really driven this is the conversation on COVID-19. And how do we maintain our facilities clean and disinfected? And how do we have the latest and greatest equipment to do that? And by outsourcing, you have a national company, in this case, it's a company called ABM, uh, that works across the country in schools, in other industries, um, and they have access to the best equipment and the best training. And so this way we can start to ensure our community that our facilities are going to be clean as clean can be relative to COVID-19. And we'll have, as an example, electrostatic sprayers, which is the latest way to keep your, your buildings clean. Uh, and the other part too is, and I'm going to say this, I don't know that it was all heard yesterday, but conservatively, we, we believe it's a $200,000 savings. It could be greater than $200,000 because we were looking at salary issues, um, but there's also savings associated with product. We no longer have to buy the product to put in the machines. We do have to buy some product, paper products is on, still on our responsibility, but, but the other product is not. And so again, a $200,000 savings there at conservatively, it could be higher than that. Um, and then we're brought through 23, I'm drawing a blank right now, Carlos. 190,000 is what it'll be this year. In the past, I've always put it in the capital because knowing that we didn't get all of the capital that we should be getting. Now that we're pretty much um, giving our capital dollars, our DAA money, plus with what we're doing to leverage our um, funding with the uh, ESCO, the SFB, and bond money, I feel like our facilities are really going to be set for probably the next nine years, ten years, from what I'm hearing. So why not put that um, Prop 123 piece in the MNL for a contingency? So. And so, and so when you turn around and look at that, just very quickly with those numbers, we're sitting on an additional $600,000 that are safety nets. And so that $600,000 could take 150, or excuse me, 150 kids that might not show up. So it's conservative in the sense that we went ahead and have these safety nets. Now, when you look at, at funding in the state of Arizona, um, and you look at even the recession in 2007, the tendency will not be to touch the base support level. Our budget is, is is, is determined based on the base support level. That's the number of kids times the amount they're going to give you per kid. And so even if we get into the skinny budget, I'd be hard pressed to believe that the governor's going to come in and it's and it's protected under law inflation. It's all part of the inflation factor. That's what the whole lawsuit was about. Uh, so we don't think the base support level, which drives them MO, is going to go down. Now, next year, they may decide not to fund the inflation, but as of this year, they funded that inflation at 1.7. So we don't we believe the MO budget is going to come in where the MO budget does come in. Now, might they go ahead and try to do something with DAA? Might they go ahead and try to do something with some other things? Yeah. Will it be this year? I'm not so sure it will be. Uh, you're going on an election year to begin with, um, and so you're not going to come in and, and take too much away from education on the election year. You might next year after the election's over. But again, that'll be next year's budget. I might come to you with a totally different plan, but next year I might say we're freezing everything. Well, we depend upon what the budget says. So we believe, based on those kind of factors and the safety net, this is a conservative budget while still addressing the needs that people have suggested we need in the district. So any questions? Yeah. Going back to the um, outsourcing of custodial services, since this is just basically a study session, we're not voting to accept no. that or not. No. This no. is just to bring it to our attention at no. this point for us to think about it, research no. it, and then will this be on the agenda for our next yes. board? Yes, on so June 10th, what we'll come forward with is this. We'll come forward uh, with the salary schedule. We'll over a number of those topics. And, and there's a good chance that we call the public um, uh, from, from employees who, who don't believe we should go to AB and uh, go to AB and go to outsourcing. Are they um, the only company? No, there's and, and there's another one in the, in the state. Um, these are on one GPA. They have most of the big districts here. You're talking about Scottsdale, you're talking about PD, you're talking about Peoria, you're talking about Dyser, you're talking about Agrafia, you're talking about Dalton Union, you're talking about Miranda. Uh, and so they've been very successful and they've been a long time in, in the state. 
Um, and so um, uh, as we took a look at that uh, uh, track record, I know there's, you may have received an email that suggests something different about it, Better Business, uh, Better Business Bureau. Uh -huh. um, we'll review that. Uh, again, they've been discussed that for 25 years. And so um, uh, I believe yeah. that, generally speaking, uh, they've been fairly strong there, but they've also been PB for close to 20 years, I believe. So. I, I have a couple of questions, if that's right. Um, yeah. uh, the first one, I want to go back real first, and then I, I'd like to come back to the outsourcing idea since we're just talking about it. But um, you know, when we talk about having competitive salaries, looking at all that and talking about competitive to our area, um, the comparisons, I haven't, did we have something, did we ever have a sheet that had the comparisons between Queen Creek School District and uh, Apache Junction and Florence? Or, like, Do we know? Yes, with, especially with this new proposal, where we match up with them? Um, we're still below Queen Creek. Apache Junction, I believe, went to did we say forty thousand five hundred or forty one thousand? Four. I think they have gone to forty one this year. Forty one this year, which this is the start of the conversation when we're sitting there saying, okay, I think with Florence and Apache Junction, we can't be competitive with them because they were above us by two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars, notwithstanding east of us or excuse me, west of us when we get into Maricopa and the difficulty. Uh, we can't right now compete against the 50% overrides, but we want to get a little bit closer. And so that's why we, we, we did that. We would have been the, the lowest paid in the surrounding areas, including Pinal County, had we not made this, this move. So by 40, by have a base of 42, that does make us higher than Florence? Slightly uh, higher than no, I think we're, we're, uh, we're higher in AJ. I think we're slightly lower in Florence. If I remember, yeah. 43. She might be like at 43. Right. But Florence is always desperate to try to like. But 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 I, what I'll say is, I mean, if, if I'm coming in for a position and there's you know four or five thousand dollars difference, I might change my mind. If we talk about a one thousand dollar difference, then then maybe don't change your view. You know, then you stay with us. If you after five years go to leave, um, and again, I don't know what other districts are doing with the forty dollar change in, in classroom site funds. We went ahead and purposely went for that, so that we'd be closer to four thousand dollars next year. So we're trying to do things that, uh, that at least we can be as aggressive as we possibly can uh, relative to this competitive issue, um, because there is a um, there's a, a tight market to begin with for teachers, depending on what you decide to do relative to COVID-19. And uh, if you go to smaller classes and sizes, that implies that you have to have more classes. I'm not sure what money is to build the classes, but then I have to have more teachers. Well, if, if 225 school districts in the state of Arizona decide to do that, that shortage of teachers just got tremendously short. Right. And so that's why we want to be more competitive. Perfectly. Well, yeah, of course. Um, okay, thank you. And then coming back to the outsourcing question, um, I actually am familiar with ABM. And um, just to share, just so to add to the, to the discussion, um, a lot of the, so with the different, Actually, in, in one particular scenario, uh, when I worked uh, with American Leadership Academy, we went through this process as well, the trying to decide to outsource. Um, so my, one question I have for you is, what, what assurances did ABM give you guys that our people that were employees of us that we obviously we care about, what assurances did they give you that, I mean, how did they assure you that our, our people will actually still have jobs? That was a discussion from the start. You said that if, if they can't have jobs, it's jobs they have right now, there might be some advancement jobs, then we're not going to move forward with this. Mm -hmm. And so we're not even going to the contract. Um, I think one of the issues that this out to that people got to realize too is, is there's a shortage of lots of positions. In custodial positions with a $12 increase, it's not like there's 6,558 custodians sitting in San Dan Valley looking for a job. So we'll go ahead and wipe out all the custodians in, in the district, and I'll just go ahead and pull these custodians here. Uh, the reality is, whether you do it in custodial, whether you do it in food service, whether you do it in busing, uh, all of those can be outsourced. Uh, there's still uh, there's still a, a limitation on the number of uh, individuals that are out there that, that need jobs. And so uh, their tendency has been in, in organizations going, um, and especially in our case, they walk our sites, they were impressed with our sites, how our sites looked and the job we were doing. Um, and so at this point, uh, there's nothing that would lead us to believe that, that they were going to do anything different. Okay. That was just one of the, so my experience with them was that they, they made similar assurances and uh, we cared a lot about, about the custodial people that we had and 
it, it just, once they actually became their employees, we really had no control over right. what they did with them. And, uh, and so many of the people that we loved who were actually fantastic custodians were now hired by them, but then now they were under control. And so they moved people around and, and, and ended up, you know, and getting rid of, and people lost their jobs. And in some cases, you know, it was just that, that one aspect was just kind of difficult. Cause I understand the business perspective of it. And I understand the, the financial potential gains of it. Another couple of things just for consideration as we discuss it, but, um, it was interesting, but but a lot of these workers who came in, although they wanted to do a, a good job because their employers, you know, because it would reflect on ABM, um, my experience was, and kind of the experience across um, the organization was that a lot of the the workers who came in from ABM obviously didn't didn't care as much about the school as as of course our people who had been there for a long time. You know, a lot of our own custodians do they do above and beyond all the time. And, uh, and the ABM people were, they were dead set that there was only certain things that they were gonna do and it was all part of the contract. And, and so if we ever asked them to do things that we were used to custodians doing, like sweeping certain areas or um, you know, things like that, uh, then that became a fight with ABM because now they're like, but that's not within the contract, that's not within the parameters of what we've hired, you know, what, what we contracted to do. And, and so kind of just some of those general things where when we had custodians who worked for us who loved the school, loved the kids, loved the families, and were willing to go above and beyond constantly outside of whatever we could put as their normal duties, um, that was just one area that became a frustration with, with ABM. Um, so sometimes, it, it, in, in some regards, the school wasn't as clean as it had been with people who cared more about it, you know, who had felt like a part of the team. Um, that was just one aspect I wanted to share. And then, um, and then, of course, then when it came to the type of people that came, of course, they hopefully vetted it and stuff. But as opposed to when we hired our own people who we knew and, and you know, we made those choices. And if somebody turned out to be a bad custodian, we just changed them. You know, we, we hired a, a new one. Sometimes it was a process. If it, one of the custodians that ABM had turned out to not be very good, then we'd have to have a whole discussion with ABM. Now, obviously, they tried to make us you know, they didn't want to lose our business. So they would eventually say, okay, well, well, you know, they try to work and say, well, maybe we could switch somebody out or, well, but we don't, we don't have anybody that can switch out right now. Uh, might be two weeks before we can switch out. And, you know, it was just kind of a, that was another kind of a hassle. Um, anyways, it, ultimately we actually ended up choosing to, to switch back to hiring our own custodians because of the frustrations that came just as a consideration. Now this may be maybe ABM and maybe the situation here would be a benefit to our district and maybe it would work out good. Um, I know there's savings that, that they're mentioning here, plus the option and, and the availability of certain products. Um, that was also kind of their main selling point, even, you know, back a few years ago when, when I was having conversations with them as well. Um, anyways, so just some, I don't know if we want to talk more, about that or other questions, but well, well, I mean, we'll have those. Has um, any of our principals been approached to get their opinion on whether they would like to have this and how it would affect? Yeah, we've had a discussion in leadership, and I'm sure we'll have some more discussions. Now, I mean, I'm not trying to throw a wrench. I just want to add no, no, information I mean, to I, the I, conversation. I mean, no, this is well, just from experience. Right? No, yeah. this is what's going to be about. I'm always kind of stuff. Is, is there some conversation that has to take place? Again, when we take a look at, uh, as I told, I, I'm up front with the staff when I met with them yesterday. When we take a look at all the factors, um, I believe it's in the best interest, um, uh, and then we'll have a conversation. And depending on how the vote goes, um, I believe the vote yes or no, um, uh, but it'll be a, a thorough conversation. And, and we've looked at the numbers both ways, um, so we're prepared uh, in both ways. Obviously, um, uh, that changes the, the configuration some, but but we we look at those numbers and we'll make. Right. Anything else? Yeah. Like, how many people are we talking about? We have uh, uh, 42 custodians. And is this an all or nothing deal? <clears throat> Meaning, at, at, at it's, the, it's all or nothing, you know, can, can there be a site, a custodian, or that's. Right. As, as of this point, it's all or nothing. I, I will be talking to ABM to give us a, a slight uh, uh, look at a couple different uh, 
scenarios. Uh, places I've been, if we had, let's say, 42, and I don't mean to minimize this, so, so please don't take that away, but you have uh, the 42, uh, 20 of them that are five years or less with us, uh, another 17 that are, are um, six to 10 years, and then five people that are, are 11 to 15 years. Um, had we had 25 people that were 25 years with, with, or longer, we'd be having a different conversation because uh, in those kind of situations or someone that close to retirement, we'd look at it different. Given the numbers we had and the amount of turnover we've had, um, that's one of the factors that went into it. So as, as of this point, uh, it's an all or nothing. Uh, I'll ask uh, ABM for a couple of scenarios, but, but that's why it's an all or nothing scenario at this point in time. So what I want to do real quickly, because I'm looking at the clock, uh, just to give people an, up, uh, an update on some of the stuff that's taking place. Again, we're looking at approximately 22 million. This number may change. Uh, that we're going to work on our schools within the next year without going for a tax increase from the voters and without spending our DAA money. Again, back to how can we utilize DAA as a safety net because we have these funding sources. We'll be using capital facility bonds, the bond money that's left, SFB funds, uh, energy performance contracting, and adjacent waste funding. Uh, the work will go to all of our schools, and in this case, the range of the school dollar amounts will be somewhere between $1.7 million and $7.2 million uh, at each of the schools. Um, and again, if you see some of the scenarios, ESPC is for Energy Savings Performance Contracting, SFB, the School Facilities Board, and Bond. Next slide, please. So when we look at CTA, this is all the stuff I brought to you before. Uh, the new bus turnaround loop, fire lane paving, parking lots, new fencing. Uh, you can just see in their case, it's a $3.4 million uh, increase. That will also include uh, renovations to the classrooms for where the old school will be, the old district office. So that network's included in here. It hasn't been broken out as an old school. I believe it's roughly eighty dollars to $100,000. Uh, that'll be the renovation portion for the for the old schools. The old schools will be in the buildings where uh, I was, my building, where Bruce and Carla was, and where the food bank offices were. There'll be a fence that runs down along that sidewalk that blocks those kids from going on to CTA. Uh, the area that they'll have is that grass area between what would be my office and Carla's office is, is where the kids would, would, would go out. We're asking the SFB to change that from undesignated space as, as uh, administration building to classroom space uh, and they're in a process that's supposed to go to the SFB in June. So those guys get about uh, 3,400, excuse me, 3.4 3 million. And if we go to the next slide, again, you'll see Ellsworth. Uh, in the case of Ellsworth, uh, you will see in some cases, you'll see HVAC, in other cases you won't see HVAC, and that's just based on the age of the of the HVAC. It didn't fence a lot if it was too, if it hadn't been old enough. and so. That's why you only have three buildings that are going to HVAC. But again, $2.3 uh, million. If you see weatherization, that's just a fancy word for painting. So we're, we're painting buildings. That's that's what they, they call it at the SFB. Uh, next slide. Okay, Harmon, you'll see that they do get HVAC, but they don't get the weatherization. Yeah, they were so painted last painting, year, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but their number goes up because they have HVAC in there. So you're at 1.7 there. You go to the next slide. Is ranch 2.4 million. Again, you're going to see a lot of the same projects from, from place to place. If we go then to Symington, they're similar to uh, Harmon at 1.7. They'll get the HVAC, but they won't get the weatherization because they got painted last year. They also had roofing work, both Harmon and, and Symington had roofing work done uh, last year. And then if we slide up to uh, CMS, you'll see that they're increasing to 3.7 million. Uh, that's as much as anything about the increased size of the building. And if you go to the high school, you're up to 7.2, and again, that's the size of the plant as much as as much as anything else. Um, but again, a little over, the numbers are still bouncing back and forth a little bit, but you're over $22 million worth of work. You've probably taken the facilities uh, plan that we have, and that was put on by FMG, and we're supposed to be in about year six, and we just jumped this thing to year nine or 10. Um, uh, it'll still allow us to do some other things in the future. But this will, this will be a significant upgrade to our facilities. Uh, I've talked to a couple of people already. If you could get into the middle school, the high school right now, and see what the lighting, the effect of the new lighting. Uh, another place you'll probably see the effect of the lighting, which I noticed when we did it uh, in another district I was at, is actually on the parking lots. Uh, just how much brighter they are, but how little they throw off into the uh, community. I was in those dark skies, and so we had to address the dark skies issue. Um, but how light, the light that's thrown onto the parking lots is, is tremendous, or thrown onto the walkways. 
Um, and so that work is going on right now as we speak at, at uh, middle school and high school, as is the plumbing stuff that's taking place. Uh, the HVAC stuff, the weatherization, is all supposed to go to the SFB meeting here in, in June, uh, the first meeting in June. So we hope to get that started. All the stuff that's happening with the bus loop and all those kind of things at CTA should be starting as we speak, as should the marquee. So we're moving forward with a lot of good work there. Any questions? I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Any questions on that stuff? Okay. If we can go to the next agenda item then. Okay. So for this particular one, um, discussion on MO, possible MO override. Uh, given the timeline that's there, I would have to come to you in June with a um, uh, with a uh, resolution to go off for an MO override. Uh, and so I thought before we even did that, we ought to have a conversation as, as to whether this is even uh, uh, of an interest for you. I didn't want to assume that I knew how you felt on this um, uh, relative to what we move forward. Obviously, we had some conversations uh, back in February uh, and then the world changed. Um, and so the concern that I will have moving forward, but then I'm not going to go out. I mean, if you take a look at it, if we did an override that we in place for, for seven years, uh, the impact, if you did a 10% MNO override, we would get $2.8 million. Um, and it would, if you went to 15%, uh, you would get $4.3 million. But the tax increase um, would be a buck 16 uh, for 10% on 100,000 and buck 75 on a 50% increase. We already got a buck 60 in the secondary uh, tax rate because of the bond. So in the case if you went to 15%, it would more than double uh, what it is. It is a true tax increase because unlike other districts in the East Valley, we're not on an override. Um, and so we're not asking for a continuation. I put that in not to be a negative part to it, but I do think the concern that, that I would have, and I think leadership team as we've talked about it would have cabinet is that um, obviously we have a potential recession we have fairly high unemployment uh, we will be going and having to market this in june and or excuse me july august september because with early balloting you'll have that early balloting by october uh, and the concern will be going out and asking for that kind of increase when a whole bunch of people in the community are are unemployed uh, is a dangerous uh, situation to ask at this moment in time. However, having said that, if you guys were to come back to me and say, we understand that, but we believe the time is right, uh, we want to go ahead and move forward with it, then we'll go ahead and move forward with it. But I at least want to get a feel from you guys. Uh, if you're, if the feeling coming out of this meeting, it's not an actual vote, I'm just trying to get an idea of what you think. But if I believe the feeling is, uh, no, it's just not worth it, then you won't see this again until we decide to go out next year or the year after. We'll have that conversation later. Um, if you decide to go out, then, then what I'll present to you in June will be both options, 10% or 15%, uh, and then you just have to call the resolution and decide, uh, decide what you want to do. So I'll open it for comments. My we, feeling is that you should come with your feeling. Yes. Look at that. Yes. Did they come and look at it? Did Not they? yet. They're, they, we, we had a conversation with them. They, when we asked them to do it, it was right when COVID-19 hit, and right when the school shut down. But we have asked them to give us some baseline data that we could use either this year or in future years. Uh, and they're moving forward with that, I think, this week to be drawn on this. I think it started Wednesday, Wednesday, yesterday. And so we will have some data that I can present at the board retreat uh, as well. I'll have it. Um, uh, but again, I think in our mind, we're asking for it more because it will provide us data for future decisions. We can use it for this one, but we're looking at future too. I think it's important to look at the implications. Yeah, definitely. We also don't want to do something that's going to get, I mean, well, I don't, don't want to get it voted down now. If, if history repeats itself, it's not going to be good. <laughs> I mean, I just, I know that when it, the recession hit the last time, it, it took us five years to even pass a bond. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't mind looking at the data. But I just don't have a very good feeling about it at all. So it just hasn't been Knowing, received well in the past. No, absolutely not. I mean, and I was never is. I was out there hitting the hitting the pavement, and it was uh, it was it was bad. I mean, the thought oh, process. So you know, the thought process initially was without COVID nineteen, because uh, and I explained this, but just as a reminder, 
because you're going to have increased, there's a, there, there was a belief that this would be a presidential election where you'll have the highest voter turnout ever, uh, and Republicans tend to come out strong anyway. The, the increase will come from the Democratic side, and therefore Democratic voters tend to be more supportive of schools. Right. Making generalizations, nothing against either one of the two groups, but they, they, they tend to be more uh, supportive of schools. That was a rationale to go out. COVID-19, recession, and unemployment. Change that picture significantly. Right. I remember in February. I, I agree with what you said earlier about in February. There was a certain outlook for yeah. the economy, for people's attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last three months, things have changed dramatically with unemployment, with people still concerned about health, uh, with people on, um, you know, worrying about if they're going to get their job back. If they go, will they be healthy and safe? So when I read the agenda uh, a few days ago, just informally, I've been asking some friends. And I remember a lot of these are older people that live where I live. All 50 year olds. What's that? All the 50 year olds. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 50 year old. And um, without exception, they said they wouldn't vote for it and they don't think it is if we're on the ballot. So, but, and, and I will tell you that when you take a look at it, the, um, uh, the Yankee Terra precinct is the highest voter turnout of any of the precincts in the, in the district. We've already looked at that data. So, what, I, what I'll do from what I'm hearing is. Let, we'll get the results back based on the results we get back. Uh, how we share it, uh, I will wait and see how I share it, whether it's a board meeting as a report, whether I send you guys something. Um, we'll stay, wait to see what it says. If it says something different than what the conversation is here, then uh, you'll, you'll potentially see it as a board agenda item either on the 15th or the 10th or the 15th. If it comes back overwhelming with a concern, then, then I'll be sure with you too. Bobby, when you get chat over there, start talking to the people. <laughs> I, no, I always fight for bonds. I do agree. I mean, before the COVID, overrides. I think the economy was good. I think that people were really wanting, um, we're starting to understand the whole, the reasoning why our um, salaries were the way they were because we didn't have the override, the M M O override, that that's kind of what we needed to, to bump up. That's the difference between our our district and Queen Creek and Chandler, because they have how many overrides going? I mean, there's a lot and bonds and everything. I think they pass one every year. So um, I think they were starting to understand that, but now I'm thinking that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more like, how am I supposed to, my, my family, I, my, my money needs to go to my family right now. So. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at what the data says and then, then figure out how to present it to you. Okay. So just, so you know, just so you know, too, in the last 13 years, I have voted for every bond and every override that Combs put out, even when my kids didn't go to this district. We, we appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, any announcements? Are we to announcements now? Yeah. Okay, does anybody have any announcements? Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 No, motion carries four to zero at 733.